must say thanks to Matthew because a lot of what he said, he, Matthew spoke about the biggest clusters and how amateurs can be involved in them. I'm going to talk about the smallest clusters and some that are so small they may not even really, even really exist. Um, <clears throat> I want to actually make a small confession in, in this talk because I want, and I also want to invite you to imagine my surprise when I recently um, paged through the, the Cambridge Photographic Star Atlas, which was published at the end of last year. And going through it, I, I saw, quite surprisingly, my name up there in lights, <laughs> as it were. And I want to share with you the story about how this came about, because the title really is, um, really is quite correct. But I think the best way to start the story is just to say a few words about um, open clusters, and I'll do it briefly because I'm hungry. These things are really beautiful. They are astrophysically very important. But before we can gain, as Matthew was pointing out, if you want to know, if you want to know about the whole universe as a large structure, you first need to have a catalog of basic understanding of the stuff. So what we know at the moment is there are 2,000 of them, and that total is only reasonably completed within about 3,000 light years from the sun. And calculations and guesstimations show that there are at least 100,000 out there. So our sample is already small. These things are typically small, less than 10 arc minutes with less than 20 stars. And they've got ages that are very young or very small compared to the age of the Milky Way which they're in. And that will feed back to a problem which we encounter with open clusters because these things are young compared to, compared to the host system. You need to know a little bit more if you want to characterize them completely. You need to know things like their proper motions, radial velocities, the metallicity of the stars. But once you've got all that information, then it opens up a cornucopia of information about our own Milky Way. You can learn about the dynamics, the evolution of the galaxy based on a study of open clusters. And the reason for that, or galactic clusters as they used to be called, the reason for that is one can measure things like the ages of a cluster, whereas it's impossible to measure the age of, an indiv of a given star. If there's a, I think I, that's correct. If there's a field star, somebody points says, how old is that star? There's no way of doing that. Is that correct, Ian? I'm not doing this Yeah. And apparently mass can only be get gotten to within 10% based on spectra and, and, and so on. But because open clusters are stars that are formed at the same time and they have typically the same composition, one can examine their evolution, you can draw color magnitude diagrams, and you can fit main sequence stuff, and you can get all this um, basic info. Um, I have put the names of the photographers at the bottom, because otherwise people say I stole things again, like I'm going to show you now what, <laughs> what I didn't discover. This is one of the first two problems you encounter when you try to study open clusters, is that you don't know where the cluster begins and where the field stars enter the mix. So when you construct what they call a color magnitude diagram, you plot the magnitude of the stars, and you're not sure on that graph are you plotting actual cluster members or you're also plotting just some random thing that's in the background. You can see in this photograph it, it could be tricky to decide where Messier 7 begins uh, and where the field ends. The, uh, the second problem is that open clusters, because they are much younger than the galaxy and they go through the whole life cycle in a short time, um, various gravitational effects happen, mass segregation, larger stars going to sit in the middle, the outer stars evaporate, tidal stripping, and they disappear into the field. So where are the older clusters or the less populated clusters? And in fact, is that thing in the middle a cluster, and where does it begin? Does that star there in the top left belong to it, and, and so on. So these are, um, these are particular issues. As far as I know, the first guy to address this was a Dumini, John Mitchell, Michel, and um, he, he made, he, his argument was about the Pleiades. He said that if stars were just randomly distributed across the night sky, we wouldn't really expect to see clusters of stars somewhere. And he guessed that, or somehow calculated, that there was a 1 in 496,000 chance, if it was a pure random distribution of stars, that this, the Seven Sisters would be that little tight grouping. That's typically the first statistical argument made in astronomy. There was a guy about a century before him, um, Hudirna, and Hudirna made a similar statistical argument, but he didn't use numbers. He just reasoned out 
that the distribution of deep sky, sky objects in the sky is significant. It's not just a random distribution of little blobs. That's the best picture I could get of, of the Reverend, because there's none on record, and there's only a brief description of him. Well, no, this is now Anglican Dominion. He said the description of him is a little short man of a black complexion and fat. <laughs> From this I learned, whatever you do, make sure there's at least one cool picture of you on the internet somewhere so that you don't get written up. <laughs> you don't get written up like that. Jerusalem, 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 he built um, a telescope, his own. This was in, in before John, William Herschel uh, was going around making scopes. He built a 30 inch. He sold that to William Herschel. And because Michel was making these statistical arguments, that sparked William to go look for double stars. So the poor man was going around looking for double stars and cataloging them. And then, as another bracket, I sometimes speak in footnotes, as another bracket, it was William's sister, Caroline who discovered a deep sky object, and when William heard that, he realized that he could also hunt deep sky objects. He didn't only need to look for two little dots and measure their separation. Um, so, in a, in a sense, this domini sparked William, and William sparked his son John, and that's probably why John heads the leaderboard for the number of discoveries of open clusters. Um, so, John's 452 total, it's kind of cheap because some of them are in the clouds. Most of these were discovered a few k's that way when Herschel came down to the Cape. Um, yeah, I, I, I put Houdina in at the bottom because he's not very well, very well known. But yes, Where's these guys... Name? Sorry? Where's your name? Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 these guys were doing... Um, what we essentially do today still, but we may not admit it, they were using the, the most advanced image processor that we have, which is the human eye or the human brain. And they would be looking through an eyepiece, looking at an object, or looking at a field, and one of the cognitive toolkits you've got is to form a gestalt or a hole. If I draw four dots, depending on how I arrange them, you'll say, but that's a straight line, or you'll say it's a rectangle, or you'll say it's crooks, and you know it's a real thing. You can point to crooks and we can all recognize it. <clears throat> but it doesn't have to be a real thing. It's just how we perceive it. With the advent of photography, um, you often hear people saying, that made this more objective. But that's not the total truth, madam, because what photography definitely did is it made it persistent. I could not take the photograph and show you, and I could convince you that here is an object. But it still runs through our perceptual filters. Brian Skiff at, at Lowell Observatory is very fond of saying, when he, when he shows off the big refractor there, he says that at the front of a telescope, there's an objective. And at the IP's end, there's a subject. And there's, a, there's a very good lesson to be, to be learned in that. Touching on what Maxi was, was pointing out, but with, with the big clusters, um, from, let's say, the 80s, well, no, yeah, in, in the last couple of decades, um, as Matthew also said, vast amounts of data has become available, large surveys doing all sorts of things, which also feeds into open cluster research. These are just star catalogs, so unlike Matthew's more advanced galaxy um, observation, people like these astrometric and, and photometric catalogs are really huge things and they have to be trawled through to find whatever it is you, you're looking for. But modern open cluster studies, probably I think you can say Lingard Lund with his, with his card catalog was the first dedicated compilation of open cluster stuff. And as the decades ticked over, there's roughly been a revolution every 10 years in sort of a step size of um, information load. But starting with the 2000s, people started mining the very large catalogs, Dennis, Tumas, and searching in these digital catalogs, searching for um, using a friend of a friend or a nearest neighbor algorithm or some way to look for a little clustering. When, it, when, when two mass came out in 2003, I loaded them all up onto my PC because they came on 10 DVDs that were double-sided, and it took two days just to copy it onto, <laughs> onto my hard drive. But using similar procedures, one can search through the data and look for some kind of pattern. With open clusters, you can look for not only positions, but you can ask, are the magnitudes also related 
in a given field. It takes forever and a day. But fortunately now in the 2010s, they specifically the Russians for some reason are very keen on trawling through large data sets. And the latest work is by Sergei Kopasov, who's, who's found very good automated algorithms for finding clusters. Again, um, they specifically also would claim that their techniques are objective. It's not really objective. The criteria are merely explicit. They're simply stating their assumptions and they're saying our fudge factor is two, and that's an arbitrary value. So the objectivity debate is a different um, is a different one. But what I did is I asked myself, will uh, John and Dunlop and all these blokes had very carefully gone through the night sky, looking at a certain scale, and their brains had formed gestalts and had found clusters of stuff. And I wondered where else had people done the same thing? Where did you have advanced observers looking at the sky on a different scale, forming different gestalts, and maybe they discovered clusters? And then I realized that those poor, poor people who sat behind transit instruments and were timing stars moving by, they must have been bored out of their minds. And maybe while they were studying the sky at a constant scale, they saw something which somebody like the Herschels and Dunlop and so on would have missed. So I sat paging through 30 old um, catalogs, astrometric catalogs here in the archive. They are exactly as exciting to read as a phone book because it's just long tables of numbers. But from time to time there's a footnote. And this is, for example, a collection of um, stars. So each entry here is, is, a, is a star and there's a comment next to it. So if you take, I don't know, Trumpler 24. Then the chap, probably Rumker, who was doing the Brisbane catalogue when he was looking at that star 5891, noticed a number of stars in the field. And if you then go and compare those positions with modern catalogs, you find today we call that thing Trumpler 4. But it should have been probably Brisbane and something or other. So those are the ones that could be identified in modern catalogs. But some other ones remain that could not be identified in modern catalogs. And this was the list of stuff that was taken by the Cambridge Atlas and then very kindly given my name to, but it really wasn't me who found them. Um, so you can see that I chose this one because Ian will be talking about, about Lakyle. This was one of Lakyle's objects, and it's had no other name since, I don't know, January the 4th, 1751, or whenever, when Lakyle first saw it. And it pretty much looks like it could be something. It's now got my name, but it's not me. It was Lakyle who found it. And it's very tempting to go through that two mass data and to take, some, or, 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 in this case, the Tycho data, the Tycho 2 survey, and go look at the proper motions and plot them and see if there's some kind of clustering effect. So suggesting that this may be a real, a real object. Um, I'm not going to get involved in that, so I'm very keen to, to hear what Sergei Kopisov and his people find out as their surveys move um, into the southern skies. And in closing, just point out to you the existence of the Deep Sky Hunters Group. Um, again, this is a modern web-enabled internet era initiative of people who are interested in discovering non-stellar stuff out there. Uh, mostly amateurs, but there are professionals or members. It's an open Yahoo group, and they look for deep sky stuff. And you are, of, of course, all welcome to join. Thank you very much. Uh, Magda, of course, is also in the book, naturally. Her list is longer than mine. <laughs> Time for lunch. Catch you. Uh, you mentioned in one of the early slides that the, that the existence of these clusters and their properties can be used to determine um, other kinds of dynamic properties of the, of the galaxy itself. Yeah. And you can make a lot of inferences from right. these clusters. So who is doing that work? I think, um, I don't know, maybe somebody else will say, but certainly the, the, those catalogs are typically data mined. So once somebody's got a comprehensive list of, say, radial velocities or something like that, they publish a list of open cluster information, then galactic astronomers, people who are interested in the Milky Way structure, 
will then use that data, for example, to trace the, the number of spiral arms the Milky Way has. One of the ways they would do that is to go to the catalogue information for clusters and use that, which is why it's important to have a complete census of clusters. If we only have, if we underrepresent the number of clusters, it's a problem. Of those 2,000 that we know of now, only 10% have all those data points known. So it's a very small percentage. If that answers your question. I used to need to say thank you very much for that very interesting talk, and I think we, Thanks, we've inspired, hopefully inspired some more to keep and help you hunt. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Very kind.